This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, so my talk today is on the fossil record and evolution of water ferns. And I'm going to be talking about work that I've done on Patagonian fossils and North American fossils. You'll see some European fossils. Um, so all parts of the world, just a little bit about myself first. Um, so there are a lot of institutions and people who have made this work possible, uh, collectors, fossil collections. Uh, Jennifer Spitko, who some of you might know, has, has been working in Alejandra's lab and has helped with some of the imaging. But I especially want to highlight my collaborators on the projects I'll be showing today. So these are my co-authors. Um, Dr. Alejandra Gandolfo, of course, has been my longtime collabor collaborator, and I was a postdoc in her lab years ago. Uh, from Argentina, Ruben Cuno, Maria Zamaloa, and also Facundo de Benedetti had been working on these projects. And then Nathan Judd, who was also a former postdoc in Alejandra's lab and uh, is now a professor, I believe, at William Jewell College in Missouri, um, was also a co-author on one of these studies. All right, so a little bit about where I'm coming from and what I'm doing at Cornell. Uh, I work at the Paleontological Research Institution, which is located across the lake. It runs the Museum of the Earth and the Cayuga Nature Center. A lot of my job is involved in outreach and I also do research. So in terms of research, and let me, ah, I do have a laser pointer. Uh, I've been working on the gray fossil site from Tennessee. This fossil site is about 4.5 to 4.9 million years old. If you were here a few years ago, I gave a talk on that fossil site, which is a fruit and seed flora. I also do a lot of outreach projects, especially on the web. I've been involved in Digital Encyclopedia of Ancient Life, writing about embryophytes, uh, putting together the regional guides of earth science in here on earth, and also working on a website on grasses for the evolution part of uh, earth at home. So here at Cornell, I've primarily been working on Patagonian paleofloras. Like I said, I was a postdoc in Alejandra's lab a number of years ago, and that's where I got my start on this project. I've done field work in Patagonia a number of times. Uh, this photo and this photo is from our recent trip, which is in, was in December. Um, I've also uh, worked on a number of studies on these floras, primarily Laguna del Unco, which is Eocene, and some Cretaceous material. Uh, recently, I worked on this paper that Teddy Mattel was also on. He was an undergrad in Alejandra's lab, and he's now at the University of Michigan. And we're continuing to work on a report on uh, fossil plants from the national parks that's sponsored by the Paleontological Society. And right now with her, I'm working on this unnamed Dixoniaceae, so uh, fossils from the Cretaceous of Argentina. And I'm also working with the Cornell University Paleobotanical Collections. So one goal for this collection is to try to enhance its curation. Uh, the collection is right now held in Emerson Hall. Uh, there are a lot of fossil cabinets and drawers. So we want to get this unpacked and organized and get new cabinets for the collection. So before I begin uh, talking about the fossils, I think a lot of people here probably are not paleontologists and don't deal with the geological time scale a lot. So uh, I'll be talking about a lot of geological time periods. The geological time scale is a relative time scale. The Phanerozoic is uh, the eon in which most of the fossil record occurs. So most of the complex macrofossils we think of. I'll be talking today primarily about fossils from the Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras. So they're younger than 252 million years old. Uh, the Mesozoic era is the time of the dinosaurs. It ends at 66 million years ago with an asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs. So this is known as the end Cretaceous extinction, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, or in older literature, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. And then after that, we have the Cenozoic. So this is when we have the rise of mammals. Um, also the flora starts to look a lot more modern. So I will also show some fossils from the Cenozoic era as well. Uh, if you haven't memorized this whole time scale, I've tried to put in a lot of numerical ages to help everybody uh, stay oriented in time. All right, so water ferns, what are they? Uh, modern water ferns or extant water ferns are in the order Salviniales. 
They're leptospherangia ferns. This is the most diverse group of living ferns. Uh, they are heterosporous, so I'll return to that in a moment, but basically they're producing two different sizes of spores, large megaspores, smaller microspores. Uh, modern salviniales are divided into two families. One of these is the Marsiliaceae. This is the water clover family. Uh, Marsiliaceae has three living genera, Pilularia, Regnolidium, and Marsilia. These plants have rhizomes and they're rooted in the soil. The other family is Salviniaceae. Uh, modern Salviniaceae consist of two genera of floating aquatic plants. So some of the characteristics of these ferns, um, I've already mentioned their growth forms. In general, compared to what we might think of as a typical or stereotypical fern leaf, they have relatively simplified leaves. So if we think of this stereotypical fern leaf as a large pinnately compound leaf, um, in these groups, the leaves can be simple. Uh, they can have two leaflets, four leaflets, or in the case of Pilularia way over here, there are no leaflets. And, and the leaves just look like these little stalks. The ferns are heterosporous. This is unusual. Most modern ferns are homosporous. So in heterosporous ferns, they produce two different types of spores, megaspores. The megaspores give rise to the megagametophytes, which produce the eggs. The microspores are smaller. They give rise to the microgametophytes, which produce the sperm. Megaspores are produced in capsules called megasporangia. Uh, each megasporangium produces only one megaspore. So there's monomegaspory in, the, in these ferns. Uh, the the microsporangia are the capsules that produce the microspores, and each microsporangium produces more than one microspore. The sori, or the groups of sporangia, can be either heterosporangiate and marsiliaceae. This means they're producing both megaspores and microspores. Or they can be homosporangiate and salviniaceae, which means they're only producing megaspores or they're only producing microspores. And this will come up later. All right, so what can the fossil record tell us about these ferns? What does it tell us in general? And what does it tell us about these ferns specifically? The fossil record is physical evidence of past life. It actually shows us the physical structures of ancient plants that are now extinct. And this is the only direct evidence we have for these plants. Obviously, we can make inferences about character evolution for things like through methods like phylogenetic analysis, but the fossil record is kind of a, a reality check on that. What was really going on in the past? So the fossil record of water ferns, plausibly, there are some older records, starts near the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. So this is about 145 million years ago. The record largely consists of spores. And there's been especially uh, an emphasis on megaspores, the megaspore record in the Mesozoic. Uh, it's not only important for understanding the evolution of these ferns, some of these things can be important biostratigraphically. So when you're looking at the ages of sediments, the environments, things like that. So what do these fossils tell us? They can tell us about characters that are no longer present in the modern ferns. So the ones I have highlighted in yellow are things I'm going to talk about today. The ones that aren't are some things that I'm not really going to talk about. They aren't projects that I've worked on, um, but I have examples of them over here. So one thing the fossil record can tell us is that some of these plants may have had more complex leaves in the past. So an example of this is hydropteridium. This fossil over here, you can see the plant reconstructed here with these more complex leaves. Uh, this is from the Lake Cretaceous of Canada. They can also tell us about some structures that are no longer present in modern genera. So one example of the, this is floats on Salvinia sporophytes. Also many floated Azola megaspores, uh, heter heterosprangent sori and Salviniaceae. So these examples I'll talk about later. And that some of these ancient ferns may have produced more than one megaspore per megasprangium. So that's based on a study that Dave Benedetti et al. did in 2020, reinterpreting these spores in sporangia of Paleozoa patagonica. So you can see this megasporangium here very clearly with two megaspores um, in this fossil form. And the plant that produced these spores is unknown. So we don't know what the sporophyte looked like. 
Uh, the fossil record can also tell us about the sequence of evolution of characters. And I'll talk about that a little bit when I get into uh, Marsiliaceae. All right, so I'm starting with Marsiliaceae, the water clover family. Uh, as I mentioned before, this, this family has three extant genera. One thing that distinguishes the extant genera is the leaf type. So Marsilia has the most complex leaves. They have four leaflets. They look like little clovers, hence the name water clover. Regnolidium has two leaflets per leaf. And Pilularia has no leaflets. So again, they just look like stalks. And this is sort of an idealized version of, of what one of these plants would look like with a rhizome the roots, the leaves, and then these little round structures or bean-like structures or sporocarbs. Those are the reproductive structures. All right, so let's take a look at the sporocarps. The sporocarps and Marsiliaceae are interesting. They are probably some sort of modification of the leaves. Um, you can see in the center, uh, sporocarps on a living plant. In the upper left and upper right are longitudinal sections, a fresh section and a fixed section. And down here is a detail of the sporocarp wall. So each of the sporocarps has multiple sori. The sori, sori are these oblong areas. And within the sori are the sporangia. So these sori are mixed. They produce both megaspores and microspores. Um, the sporocarp walls are thick and sclerified. This is a section, in this case, the, the sclerenchyma hasn't really developed the thick walls, so it's not that clear, but um, there would be multiple layers of, of sclerids here. And then when the sporocarps open, they release this gelatinous kind of structure to which these sori are attached, and these break down and release the spores. One other important thing to note about Marsiliaceae is it's not just the leaves that distinguish the genera, it's also the spores. And with a particular emphasis here on the megaspores. So here are the megaspores of the three genera. Uh, you'll notice Pilularia and Regnolidium have these appendages you know, at the tips of the, the megaspores. Uh, these are called acrolamelli. They're lobed. In the case of Regnolidium, they're also sort of twisted. And then in Marsilia, the acrolamella has actually been reduced to just a rim. So spores with these acrolamellae can be found in the fossil record. In the modern forms, there's also a gelatinous layer involved in the formation of the acrolamella. And this is all involved in, in fertilization of the megagametophyte. So the fossil spore record is really important in this group. These are some examples of Mesozoic spore types. So these are extinct spore types. So the spore record goes back to about the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. That's 145 million years ago. Uh, the Mesozoic megaspore types are Arcelites. So this really spectacular looking spore is an example of Arcelites. There are a lot of different species of this. The plant that produced these spores is unidentified. It has not been found. Um, it's assumed to be related to Marsiliaceae because of this really spectacular appendage at the tip, which looks sort of like the modern ones. The other megaspore type is Molospora. Uh, you can see the acrolamella very nicely here. Uh, Molospora looks very much like the spores of modern, <coughs> excuse me, of modern Regnolidium, uh, particularly Molospora lobata. Some other species of Molospora have different ornamentation. There are also microspores, Crybellosporites down here is one of these, which is somewhat Regnolidium-like. Uh, the other one that's usually associated with the group is Gabonosporus. And then at the end of the Mesozoic, these spore types are replaced by spores that are placed in the modern genera. So Marsilia, Pilularia, and Regnolidium. And in 2013, Collinson et al. said that these Mesozoic spore types probably really go extinct because there have been some records of the Mesozoic spore types continuing into the Cenozoic. Okay, sporophytes are what I'm mostly interested in. I work on plant macrofossils. The sporophyte record of this group goes back again about to the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. There is an older record from the Triassic. I think it's pretty dubious, so I haven't really included it here. Uh, the record consists largely of plants. 
So whole plants, also leaves and, and detached leaflets. That's mostly what's found in the record. There are a few sporocarps, and even fewer of these have spores. This is an interesting phenomenon that's been noted by paleobotanists because these, these sporocarps are so resistant. Why aren't you finding them in the fossil record? Nobody really knows. Um, there are a lot of identification problems historically and continuing to the present day with these ferns. A lot of things are misidentified into this family. All right, so the first uh, projects I'm going to talk about are the La Colonia Marsiliaceae. So La Colonia is one of the formations that I've been working on with Dr. Gandolfo and collaborators in Argentina. Um, these are three of the papers. Two of them are from La Colonia. One's about Marsiliaceae, if you want to read more about these projects. So I'm going to give two examples. One's a fossil taxon that's similar to a modern fern, almost indistinguishable. The other one is a fossil taxon with a unique morphology. So both of these come from the La Colonia formation. So a little bit about this formation and the context for these fossils. And I should say this map is a little bit weird. Uh, South America was not tilted on its axis in the Cretaceous. So North is kind of somewhere up over here. Um, the important thing though, is the La Colonia formation occurs down here in modern Chibut province. At this time, it was very near the coast. So sediments from this formation, some of them were deposited in marine settings, some were deposited in terrestrial settings. There are a lot of vertebrate fossils known from this formation. Probably the most famous is Carnotaurus, this, this guy up here, but there are marine vertebrates, there are many other things. Uh, and this is just an example of what the formation looks like today. But in the past, it looked very different. It was a very different environment. So again, the left two pictures show the formation today. Uh, the formation looks like what we might call in the US badlands. There isn't a lot of vegetation. It's very dry, it's very eroded. Uh, on the right is a reconstruction of what the vegetation might have looked like in the past. Uh, this is from a paper we published in 20, uh, 2014. So there aren't a lot of macrofossil, plant macrofossil localities from the La Colonia formation. Uh, the three are Cerro Bosta, which is up here, Canedon del Rupe, and Quebrada del Elecho. Uh, we think that these localities represent coastal lagoon environments. So these are essentially freshwater environments near the coast. And there are three categories of plants that are preserved in these environments, some of which were growing in the water. So these are the things like the, the water ferns I'll be showing, uh, and the lumbo. There is also a floating aquatic angiosperm that's maybe somewhat like Pistia. Uh, there are lowland wetland plants growing around the lagoons. So the Dicksoniaceous ferns that I showed you before, were part of this portion of the vegetation. And then there are plants that are growing even further away. So there is a macrofossil flora. There's also a polyniflora, so pollen, spores, algae, things like that. All right, so the first example I'll be showing you from this formation is fossil regnolidium. Uh, modern regnolidium, the leaf and the megaspore are shown here on the left. So remember the leaf with two leaflets, the megaspore with this nice acrolamella. This map summarizes the modern and fossil distribution of regnolidium. So the present distribution is in a very small portion of East Central South America. So Northern Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Southern Brazil. Uh, and the fossil record is kind of all over the place, sparse, but widely dispersed. So you'll notice a bunch of spore records here. These are the red circles in Eurasia, and then a few scattered macro and mesofossil reports. So down here is an example of one of these fossil spores from Kazakhstan with a nice acrolamella. Uh, here's an example of fossil leaves. These are from Russia. And then this fossil sporocarp from Georgia in the United States, which doesn't look like much, but it had very nicely preserved spores in it. So don't judge it by its cover. All right. So here are the fossils from La Colonia. So again, moderns on the left, center are the fossil are the macro fossils, and then on the right are dispersed spores from the sediments. So this gets us to one problem working as a paleobotanist in general. Plant organs 
are often not found in attachment and uh, plant pollen and spores are often not found in situ. So they're not found within the organs that produce them. So we have not found spores of Marsiliaceae within the organs of the Regnolidium macrofossils. We're assuming these two things go together because they're found in the same deposits, they're coming from the same family, everything else fits in terms of the morphology. So this plant was probably producing these spores. So you'll notice the macrofossils have pairs of leaflets to their leaves. They look almost exactly like the moderns. Here are some rhizomes here. The venation is very similar. So Regnolidium has these dichotomizing veins and also a marginal vein uh, near the, the apex of the leaf. We see this in the fossil as well. The dispersed spores look very much like modern regnolidium spores, and you can compare the megaspores here to here. They look very similar. So as a paleobotanist, this is the easiest scenario. It looks just like the modern plant. There's not really much to say. But the next example is a little trickier. And before I get into it, I just want to talk about Marsilia a little bit. Uh, so these are some examples of Marsilia, again, with the leaves that look like four-leaf clovers. Uh, modern Marsilia probably has 50 or more species uh, distributed all over the world. They produce nice sporocarps, which sometimes have these projections called teeth. And the megaspores do not have these uh, uh, a very uh, elaborate acrylamella on the tip. It's reduced to this rim. All right. So Marsilia tends to be fairly problematic in the fossil record. It's probably the most problematic member of, of Marsiliaceae, maybe Salvinielis in general. And one of the reasons for that is because there are things that look like Marsilia in the fossil record that aren't Marsilia. These are some examples of, of, of Marsilia lookalikes that are probably angiosperms. The reproductive structures haven't been found, <clears throat> but the leaf venation looks angiospermous. So one of these is Marsiliatiophyllum John Hollyi from the Dakota Formation of Kansas. Uh, notice this has three leaves or leaflets and a whorl, kind of a similar structure to Marsilia leaves. And then over here, Fortuna marsilioides. Uh, this comes from the Upper Cretaceous to Paleocene of Western Canada and the United States. So there are lookalikes in the fossil record. It does complicate things a lot. Also, Marsilia leaflets have very simple venation. It's easy to mix them up to, with other reticulate veined things in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, after a review I did in 2019, what I think is the, uh, I guess, legitimate fossil record of Marsilia. Uh, you'll notice that Marsilia is spread around the world, not in the Southern Hemisphere so much, but in the Northern Hemisphere um, in terms of its fossil record. There are a lot of spores in Eurasia and some sporophyte reports based on leaves from North America and also Europe. Uh, the leaf records come from the Upper Cretaceous and also the Eocene. One of the interesting things about this record is that all of the spore records are younger than all of the leaf records. And one debate in the literature about Marsilia is whether ancient Marsilias produced a different spore type, maybe a spore type that was similar to that of modern Regnolidium. As it turns out, we don't know because no Marsilia spores have been found in the same sediments or Marsiliaceous spores have been found in the same sediments that yield these leaves. So this is still an open question. So in the La Colonia formation, we do have a plant that's a little bit like Marsilia, but it's a little bit different. So on the left are some modern Marsilia, or pictures of modern Marsilia leaves and leaf venation. On the right are Mirasolita irupensis uh, leaves or leaflets. So the venation of Mirasolita irupensis is very similar to the venation of Marsilia. The veins dichotomize and they anastomose and they form these closed aerials. What's different is first of all, the form of the leaflet. So you can see this extended leaflet base and maybe more of a fan-shaped leaflet, Mirosolita, versus these odd deltoid leaflets in Marsilia. The whole leaf structure was also probably different. So here we have two leaflets in attachment. 
here we have a whole bunch of leaflets on the surface of a rock and it's hard to tell how they're related to one another. So we interpreted the leaves of this plant as having two leaflets. So somewhat different from modern Marsilia, but with some similarities. Uh, just for completeness here, these sporocarps co-occur co with the Mirasolita leaves. So another problem in paleobotany, again, organs tend to be detached. We did not find the sporocarps in attachment with the leaflets, so we give them a different name, even though we think they probably come from the same plant. Uh, over here in the upper right, you can see one of the Mirasolita leaflets near some sporocarps. So they occur very close to one another. There are also Molosporous spores in these sediments. So it's possible that this Mirasolita Luigio marsiglia plant was also producing Molosporous spores. That's really the only candidate right now. All right, so to wrap up this section, uh, late Cretaceous Regnolidium was similar in form in terms of its leaves and spores to modern Regnolidium. So maybe an example of some extreme stasis going on there from over 66 million years ago to the present. But in the Cretaceous and possibly even later, Marsiliaceous plants may have had characteristics of more than one modern genus and or they may have had unique characteristics not seen in modern Marsiliaceous plants. So this is what we get out of the La Colonia formation. So for the remainder of the time, I'd like to briefly go through some projects to do with Salviniaceae, so Azola and Salvinia, these floating aquatics. So I'm going to uh, go through two scenarios here, one involving Salvinia, that has sporophyte characters not found in the extant plants. Uh, this study is actually not published yet. It's something I'm working on with Facundo de Benedetti. And so we did an abstract at GSA last year. And then the second one is a published study from 2019 on Azola uh, sporophytes and spores from the La Colonia formation and the younger Salamanca formation. All right. So a little bit about Sylvania, just to get us acquainted with this plant. Uh, Sylvania plants are floating aquatics. Uh, you can see here from Q, the modern distribution of Sylvania, they're native to large parts of the world, but they are also introduced to large parts of the world where they can cause some problems. So one thing Sylvania is known as is an, invas in, as is an invasive aquatic plant. Uh, the plants uh, grow on the surface of the water, uh, they have horizontally growing rhizomes or stems that bear leaves in groups of three. So they have uh, pairs of floating leaves, which isn't really well visualized here, but the floating leaves occur in pairs. They can occur flat on the water surface or somewhat folded up. And then each of these is associated with a submerged leaf. And the submerged leaf is a root-like looking structure. So these plants have no true roots. And it's the submerged leaves that bear the sori. Uh, the floating leaves have reticulate leaf venation. So the areoles formed by the veins tend to be elongate, rectangular to hexagonal in shape. And Sylvania is really known, particularly in the literature on materials research for its hairs. Uh, some Sylvanias, not all of them, have egg beater hairs. So here's an example of these egg beater hairs. These are hydrophobic hairs which, with hydrophilic tips, and they help the water. If you drop a, a drop of water on a surface of a salvinia leaf, it'll beat up, and it helps air, hold air against the surface of the leaf. So this is probably an adaptation to its habitat. So just a little bit more about the reproductive structures. I mentioned that they are on the submerged leaves. Remember that the sori are homosporangia. So some sori have megasporangia that produce megaspores. Other sporangia have, um, other sori have microsporangia that produce microspores. So megaspores and microspores are separated into different sori. Uh, these are just examples of the megaspores and microspores. I'm not really going to talk about the spore structure today. Note the megaspores are much, much larger than the microspores. So these pictures are not to scale. In terms of the fossil record of Sylvania, I kind of feel like this is maybe the neglected record of all the water ferns. 
Uh, there actually is a pretty good literature in this case on the sporophytes, interestingly enough. So the map up here shows the fossil record or distribution of the fossil record of Salvinia. Um, notably, there are some Cretaceous occurrences. So in, in North America, here's one that is not described. So again, we have one of these groups going back to the Cretaceous. And these pictures just show some of the variety of fossil Salvinias. Um, all of them look very much like the modern forms in terms of their overall structure. Oh, and I should mention, not on this map, there are some reports from Africa, including a Lake Cretaceous report and some much younger reports. Okay, so the fossils I will be showing today come from the Hattiesburg Formation of Mississippi. This is also known as the Bowie River site. Uh, the site was first recorded in the literature in detail in 2019 by McNair et al. in Paleontologia Electronica. If some of you were here when Mac Alford was a graduate student, he was on that paper, so you may remember him. Um, one of the interesting things about this site is it's one of the few neogene fossil plant macrofossil localities in eastern North America. So there are very few neogene plant macrofossil sites in the eastern part of the United States. The neogene is 23 million years ago to 2.6 million years ago. So this part of the fossil record is really relevant for understanding our modern flora, understanding modern plant disjunctions and things like that. Uh, the best neogene record in, a, uh, in our country, in the eastern part of our country is in the Gulf Coast area. So you'll see sort of a cluster of sites down here. These are the major sites. There are other sites um, that are maybe a bit more minor or haven't been worked up. So Hattiesburg yields leaves, fruit, seeds, and pollen. And it yields Salvinia. So this fossil might be a little bit harder to interpret than some of the ones I showed previously. It's not quite as well preserved. The matrix it is in falls apart if you even look at it. Um, but you'll notice there are pairs of floating leaves here. There's another floating leaf here that's preserved sort of face on, so it's a little bit easier to see. There's a submerged leaf down here. The branches are visible there. Um, and there are, there's a saurus here. So there are some very nice preserved sauri on these. And then there is a poorly preserved structure here called a float. So you'll see the corresponding structures on a modern salvinia plant, except for the float. Because it turns out floats are not seen on modern salvinias. This is something that's only been documented from fossils. So here on the arrows and in this, this blow up in the center are some other pictures of the floats in this Hattiesburg Salvinia. These are also called in the literature inflated structures, which is maybe a little bit more neutral. Nobody knows exactly what the function of these things are, um, but they have been found in other fossils. So here are some fossil Salvinia from Columbia, uh, here's the actual fossil. Here's a drawing reconstructing what's going on. These are some floats from uh, an Eocene Salvinia. So this is older than the Hattiesburg material. Up here are some examples from Europe, which are slightly older to about the same age as the Hattiesburg material. So this is sort of an interesting observation. Not sure where it's going to go yet. The other thing that's interesting about the Hattiesburg Salvinia are the sauri. So in these fossils, the megasprangia marked by ME and the microsprangia marked by MI occur in the same saurus. So the sauri are heterosprangia. They're producing both megaspores and microspores. In modern salvinias, the typical case, I guess there have been some uh, observations of, of very occasional observations of heterosprangiate sauri, but the typical case is this one where there's a microsprangiate saurus producing the microspores and a megasprangiate saurus producing the megaspores. Um, heterosprangiate sauri in Salvinia have been documented previously in the fossil record. So again, this is a character we don't really see in modern taxa. All right. Final example quickly is Azola, the mosquito ferns. 
So Azola are really tiny floating ferns. You can see uh, in the upper center there, a picture of one of these on somebody's finger. So they're very small ferns. They have horizontally growing stems or rhizomes that bear simple leaves that are imbricate. So the leaves overlap one another and they have roots that hang down into the water column. Um, like Sylvinia, the sori in Azola are either megasporangiate or microsporangiate. So in the herbarium specimen here, you can see some microsporangiate sori. The microsporangiate sori are often more conspicuous because they have multiple microsporangia. The megasporangiate sori only have one megasporangium producing one megaspore each. And they're sort of ovoid in shape. Uh, the leaves of Azola have cavities in them that harbor cyanobacteria. These are nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria. Uh, this is one of the things that makes Azola of economic interest because it can be used uh, to help enrich soil. Uh, this is the distribution of modern Azola. Uh, the species boundaries of some of these are a little bit fuzzy, but it just gives you the idea that it occurs widely throughout the world. All right, the spores of Azola are also really, really interesting. So the microspores occur in groups in a matrix, and these groups are known as massulae. And the massulae actually have hairs on them. These hairs are sometimes called glycidia. And a lot of Azolas, the hairs have these anchor-shaped or arrow-shaped tips on the end. In some, they don't. In some, the tips might just be pointed, or especially in the fossil record, you see some that are circinate, so they're curled, almost like a young fern. The megaspores are also pretty spectacular. They're very complex. Uh, they're sometimes called megaspore apparatuses. So the megaspore has a megaspore body. Sometimes it has this rim called a collar. And at one end, it has these structures that are called floats. In modern Azola, there can be three floats in one tier or nine floats in two tiers on the megaspore apparatus. And there is sorting in Azola by clade. The three floated species and uh, the species with anchor tipped glycidia occur in one clade section Azola. And the nine floated uh, species that either have no hairs on their massulae or simple hairs, so not anchor shaped tips, are in section Rhizosperma. So the fossil record of Azola is um, extensive. The map up here just shows the sporophyte record. Notice again, we have a lot of records from the Northern Hemisphere, not a lot from the Southern Hemisphere. This is really probably reflective of, of collecting effort and publication um, opportunities more than it is maybe reality. Um, so the spore record begins in the late early Cretaceous, the Albion. Interestingly, there are a lot of multi-floated species of Azola megaspore apparatuses. So these would be apparatuses with more than nine floats and they occur from the late Cretaceous to the Eocene. So maybe this gives some impression that there's a little bit of directionality in the evolution of these species. Uh, the sporophyte record is known from the late Cretaceous to the Miocene, and there are about 14 species. So the two I'll show today are from South America. Uh, the first of these, Azola coloniensis, comes from the La Colonia formation, which I talked about earlier with Regnolidium and Mirasolita. Uh, on the left are the sporophytes. I don't necessarily have a lot to say about these. Um, they're not so different from modern Azola in their structure. There might be a slight difference in the leaves. Uh, you can see uh, uh, megasporangiate sorus here and microsporangiate sori down here. One of the interesting things about this uh, species is that it's associated with these spores. So these are linked under the same name, Azola coloniensis, but the spores have not been found in C2. They've been found dispersed in the same sediments. So the megaspore apparatuses have many floats, 18 to greater than 20. The microspore massulae have these uh, hairs with anchor shaped tips. And these were described by De Benedetti et al in 2018.
There's another species of Azola from a slightly younger formation. This is the Salamanca formation, it's Danian in age. So about 66 to 61.6 million years old. It also comes from Chibut province, Argentina. So the same general region as the La Colonia, uh, uh, the La Colonia formation. The interesting thing about the sporophytes of Azola Keuha is that the uh, roots occur in fascicles. So they occur in these big groups on the sporophyte. And they're very much like a modern species called Azola nilotica, which is native only to Africa. The spores, the megaspore apparatuses, have uh, six floats and one tier. Unfortunately, these could not be directly observed because they're under attack. So this interpretation is based on impressions in that cap. The microspore massively have these spine-like hairs, so they don't have the anchor-shaped ends. So one of the interesting things to note about this is uh, the complication it presents for understanding the evolution of Azola. So in addition to Azola keuha and Azola nilotica, there's another fossil species with these fascicled roots, Azola shoftii, that comes from the Paleocene of Canada. So it's a similar age to the Argentinian material. But this Azola has multi-floated megaspore apparatuses. So what these things are suggesting is that there really isn't, if they're part of the same lineage, which we kind of think they might be because they have these fascicled roots and some other features that are similar, there isn't a clear directionality in the number of floats on the spores. We've got 15 to, to more than 20 in this one, six in this one, and then nine in the modern. All right. So to conclude this part of the talk, uh, fossil Azola and Sylvania species have some characteristics not seen in the modern forms. And the fossil record of Azola really complicates our understanding of morphological evolution in the genus. So I guess to conclude, the fossil record adds a lot of richness to our understanding of the morphology of the water ferns and potentially uh, to our understanding of their evolution, particularly their morphological character evolution. But there's a lot of danger maybe in over-interpreting things or in misidentifying things, especially in Marsiliaceae. So um, I think with that, I'll take any questions. Yes. Do you think that the Sylvina floats by the evolving symbiosis, given, you know, Azola has that cyanobacteria in, in the leaves? Um, it's an interesting question, and I have no idea. <laughs> the floats are supposedly a, a leaf structure, or? They look like a leaf-like structure. So if you look at them, they have, a, like, a very thick mid-vein on them, and they have reticulate venation. So they do look like sort of a, a some sort of modified leaf. Yeah. Do you know if the ferns you talked about are inbreeding or outcrossing, and if that depends on which source they produce? Um, no, I do not. So I'm sorry I can't answer that question, but <laughs> yes. I have two questions. Very nice one. Thank you. So the, what's the function of the acrolamella? How do, does it work for fertilization? Just kind of curious. Mm -hmm. My first question and second one is like, um, Marciaceae have these uh, parallel veins, but the uh, Sabinaceae has more reticulum. Mm -hmm. It is possible that the extinct plants have this, the ancestral, the ancestral had different kind of venation, so it might be not just parallel, might be something different, because the sister clay has a different kind of venation. Right, so um, I'm not sure about the solid acrolamella to, Address your first question if I can get out here. Or maybe I can. Anyway, um, I was going to go back to one of the earlier slides. So the, the gelatinous bell, mm -hmm. there is a sperm lake inside where the sperm gather okay. uh, prior to fertilization. And there's a really nice paper on it, I think by Schneider and Pryor, that talks all about the fertilization in these ferns. So I'm not sure how much the solid acrolamella is involved in that. Um, the other question was about the venation. Mm -hmm. So Marsilia actually does have reticulate venation. The venation in, in Selvinia is more complex, certainly. And Regnolidium has dichotomizing. Um, so in terms of the ancestral fern, 
Uh, my guess would be it's probably dichotomizing, but yeah, there isn't there isn't a clear stem member of the entire order in the fossil record so far. So mm -hmm. where is the hydroteridium um, place in the ground? A lot of the analyses place it as a stem member of Selvaniaceae, although an alternative placement is as stem Selvaniaceae, at least in one but analysis. That one is rooted, right? Yeah, so that one that one's a little bit more of our ciliaceae like in its structure. Yeah, in terms of its rhizome. Yes. Yes. The Salvinia um, weird rootlet things. So those are leaves. That is your interpretation. Yes. Is there, can you figure out how many are involved? Is it? Uh, I mean, is it one kind of stem with leaves on it, or are they coming directly off the? Upper one, or I assume that all those threads are like different parts of one leaf, right? Yeah, I that's what I think it is interpreted as. Yeah, so you think it's a single leaf that comes down, or is there more than one? No, I think it's a single leaf. It's a single leaf, yeah. Interesting, okay. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.